Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Lori. This is Ask Dr. Lori Live. It's good to be with you. Don't forget to sign up for my newsletter. That's first off the bat. Why? Because that's going to help you. It's going to help you learn how to sell, learn what to look for, how to tell, all the information that's going to help you on the newsletter. All you have to do is go to the thumbs up free tab on my on my website at drlorev.com, put in your email address, and we'll send the newsletter to you. It's right there, the free tab, thumbs up. <laughs> I'm taking your questions tonight. It's always good to be with you. And later, I'm going to show you some of the deals that I found that you can go and get. So I'll show you the deals toward the end of the video too. So, you know, uh, I, I was talking about deals and ones that I found, and I put up a precious moments uh, deal that I found that I basically showed you which rare ones were in this lot of precious moments figuring. I got a lot of pushback because so many of you are like, we use those for target practice. We don't like precious moments figurines. I can't resell them. Well, you're losing out because there are people who are reselling them. And, you know, it's fine what you want to do. I like you to comment, be part of the community. That's great. Um, but you're not watching the video to get the information that's going to help you. <laughs> so take a look at the video uh, too. I revealed the rare ones that are collectible and are valuable. And it's always based on sales records where similar ones have sold. So I want you to see that. Um, you might be wondering why I'm doing an Ask, an Ask Dr. Lori live on Thursday night. Well, uh, many of my fans and followers in the southeastern United States and the southern states have said, Dr. Lori, you're doing Wednesday night. We're at church. How I forgot this, I don't know, because years and years and years of me, of course, on the road, I oftentimes did events during the week and never did Wednesday nights because of that reason. Yet some of our friends who are attending church services or other things on Wednesday nights, a lot of groups also meet on Wednesday nights. Um, they in fact uh, prefer Thursday. So, you know, I try to accommodate all of you anyway. <laughs> Had an exciting week, exciting week. Um, some producers want me to contribute to their shows. So I've been in touch with them and uh, interviewed by Bloomsburg uh, Business Week magazine about the thrifting industry because they know that I know about the thrifting industry. A lot of interesting stuff is happening. So I've uh, been busy. It's been a busy week. So I hope you've had a good week and a busy week too. Um, and again, I'm going to take your questions live. So um, if you have questions, you know, put your question in once. You don't have to cut and paste it a million times. My producers will find your questions and they will put up those questions. Make sure your questions are clear. You know, give me enough information so I can answer it for you. Okay, let's see what we've got. You can't afford anything, but can you give me a percentage? Well, let me tell you something. Anytime that your appraiser wants to take a piece of your action, you probably don't have the right appraiser. So um, our fees are very, very low. Many of the things that I do with respect to appraisals are free as well. Um, but in fact, no. So I, I don't say, oh, I'll take a percentage or you can go to this guy and he'll give you a good deal. All of that is unethical. So the fees are very, very straightforward. And a lot of the things that I do in terms of appraisals are also free. So good question though. Oh, you might as well ask. Doesn't hurt to ask. So good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I have a rectangular brass tray etched only in the center. Okay. It's a still life image, image of various fruit. There's a bee and a butterfly and a ladybug and it's signed. Okay. A uh, couple of different things. If it's a brass tray and you know it's brass, it's etched in the center and then the fruits are basically etched in as well. It's not enameled or painted fruits on top. So that's going to be a difference in terms of it. Where it's signed is going to be rather interesting. Is it signed on the back? Is it a mark? And then the other thing is whether or not this is a decorative tray to be put up in a, a curio cabinet, a china closet, on the wall, or is it actually for serving? That will make a difference with respect to value too. Typically trays that are incised, right, or basically marked out with um, an incision or an intaglio is what it's called, an intaglio scratched out decoration are usually earlier than those that are painted, right? So you have to tell me whether or not you've got some color and some pigment or whether or not you have, in fact, um, just the intaglio mark as well. So I hope that helps. 20th century, definitely. So dates be after 1900. So I'm happy, Jennifer, to provide information that I can. Uh, question about oyster plates. Um, I, I really, I like your logo, Eastward Collectibles. I think your logo is pretty cool. Um, my oyster plates, you have two scalloped shaped plates. Okay. So that means they have a scalloped edge, right? A curved edge. They're unmarked. They have floral in the design and it's gilded around the edge. Most of them are gilded. 
Most of them are gilded. There's a little bit of gold leaf around most late 19th, early 20th century oyster plates. If you don't know what an oyster plate is, oyster plates are pretty straightforward. They usually have six wells and then a middle, a middle for sometimes it's cocktail sauce, sometimes it's horseradish, but a middle shell um, in the middle of the plate. Sometimes it's oval, sometimes it's round, sometimes it's a shell. And it said that it was pink and purplish. Maybe that you're trying to describe one pinkish purple and one light blue. Okay. So a couple of things about oyster plates. Usually they are, they come in groups of six or 12. Um, oftentimes they will have a mark on the back. If they're completely unmarked, but they look like porcelain, bright white clay on the underside, right? I always tell you what to look for. Bright white clay on the underside, you're going to have more higher quality pieces. Usually the really high quality pieces from England, from Limoges, France, from other places are marked. Um, the American ones may not be marked. However, you probably have a 20th century one, particularly the light blue one is probably early 20th century. When I say early 20th century, from 1900 to 1925, early 20th century, okay? Um, that's basically what you're looking at. If they're scalloped shell, they're scalloped around it, like there's a mold that's the scallop, that typically is also early 20th century too. The more decorated, the younger, typically. That's a generalization, but that's usually true with, with oyster plates. Oyster plates can be extremely, extremely expensive, very valuable. So if you don't know and you're not sure, you can always submit a picture to the website under find values, submit a photo, and I'll take a look. But And when I mean valuable, I mean I've seen one oyster plate go for 750 bucks. So they could be really valuable. You have a Baccarat crystal lamp. That's great. Baccarat crystal lamps. How would you know if it's real? A couple different ways. First of all, it would be marked usually with the Baccarat mark. Uh, Baccarat is very, very well-known marks, easy to find the mark. And you're in fact, um, so uh, you're, you are in fact able to see those particular marks. And speaking of lamps, somebody asked in the comments about a gone with the wind lamps, which are those lamps that have a bulb, uh, uh, a glass bulb and the body and a glass, sh a glass shade as well. Those can be valuable too. How do you know if it's real? Baccarat has a very specific and easily identifiable um, mark. And you also will know whether or not you've got real good, clear, beautiful crystal. Baccarat is some of the best of the best, right up there with the best of the crystal that's made. So check that out. If you're unsure, you can always send a photo to my website, of course. But Baccarat crystal lamp, if you got it for a little bit of money, you're going to do great on it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I hope you got two. <laughs> so it's really nice, really nice. I have a creamer bowl that has beautiful flowers on it. Okay, well, what's beautiful to you might not be beautiful to me. So describe the flowers. Do you have a lot of different flowers? Do you have flowers like I have roses and I have tulips and I have peonies and I have uh, gardenias, whatever it might be. It's very fragile. It has a red seal on the bottom of it. Is it valuable or not? All right, let's talk a little bit about red seals. So a red wax seal was usually utilized in the from about uh, all the way back to the 1400s to the 1800s and they were used to indicate a export mark from some country to some country so if you have that kind of seal or do you have a mark that's in red like a stamp mark on the actual creamer bowl i'm assuming when you say it's a creamer bowl you have a creamer that actually could you know put coffee or cream in your coffee and that it's ceramic um but oftentimes, if you have a red seal and you're talking about a wax seal, then you probably have a piece that's imported, right? You have something that's been imported into this United, into the country from another country, and that could make it valuable. Now, beautiful flowers, if it's very well hand painted and it's executed well, then that's what you're looking at, you know? Um, <clears throat> so that's what you're looking at, and those usually can be valuable. So the more, of course, um, better painting work, nice clay, good glaze. Um, good form, no chips, no cracks, no inclusions, no abrasions, good condition is always important. So I see the super chats and super stickers and I appreciate them very much. Thank you for supporting and showing your appreciation of the channel. I appreciate it very much. It helps us do what we do. Um, what are the three most resellable antique categories today? People love glass. People are making a lot of money on art with my help. People love jewelry and are making a lot of money on jewelry because it's easier to ship, it's cheap to um, store, and a lot of people look for it. But there's competition. 
I would also say furniture is good, but a lot of people are going, are, are basically utilizing furniture and they're doing the DIY stuff, which is helping them to take old furniture, repurpose it and make some money that way. But I think the most resellable categories are things that are rare and unusual, but I would say fine art, furniture, precious metals, including jewelry might be my top three. And I would always throw glass in there. And China is the sleeper. People are saying, nobody wants China. Nobody cares about teacups. And I am seeing people pay a lot of money for China. In my class a couple nights ago, I actually saw a fantastic collection of China that one of my uh, students got, and it was really beautiful. Um, so people are collecting China too. So yeah, that, that's the sleeper, I would say. And uh, yeah, glass is, is always good. Glass is good. Nobody gets away with not loving Murano. You know how this goes. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Thanks for your uh, nice contribution too. I appreciate all of them. So thank you very much for that. And thank you to Jay for your contribution. That's very, very kind and I appreciate it. At any level, I appreciate it. Whatever you can do is a help. So we can make more videos, keep giving you the content that you need. I want you to succeed. I'm gonna teach you how to do it. I've been doing it with the videos for a long, long time. And I'm gonna to continue to do it. Uh, you have a Pablo Picasso ink and watercolor wash on vellum, uh, 10 by six and a half inches with the sheet size. This is important. And Jacqueline, portrait of Jacqueline, very well known, 1954. He dies about 20 years later. So this is getting to be mature to late career work, right? When we think of Picasso, we think of the squished faces. You know what we think of? We think of cubism, you know, the early career work from about 1912 to about 19, you know, 30 or so. Um, so it's been authenticated by an appraiser to be authentic. Okay, so it's an authentic ink and watercolor. All right, so this appraiser didn't appraise it for you. That's unusual. So they just said, it's authentic, bye. Well, that's unusual. Um, you need provenance, right? So you need to know the history of the piece, right? You want to, and what I mean by that is who had it before you and you got to trace it all the way back to Picasso, okay? So that's the other thing you want to think of. If it truly is a watercolor and ink by Picasso, that's rather unusual, right? He was not big on watercolors. He made a lot of prints and he made a lot of original oil on canvas, but watercolor was not something that you see a million Picassos coming out in the watercolor medium. And that's important. So sometimes prints, actually lithographs can look like watercolor called aquatints, right? Um, but in fact, if you say, okay, it is, it's a portrait of Jacqueline in terms of value, you could start somewhere in the 1500 range. You can go as high as 5,000. It will depend on many different factors, including yes, whether or not it's authentic, the provenance, who did it belong to? Did it belong to, uh, uh, was it deaccession from a museum? Was it part of the Picasso family? Was it given as a gift to a Polinaire, you know, one of his friends, the poet, you know, where was it and what happened to it? So we want to know, we also want to know how it got to you. That's going to impact value as well. Um, are, are the margins intact of the paper? Is it professionally framed? Is there any tanning? What is the condition issues? So I need to see it to give you a smaller one, but if you want a ballpark, 1,500 to 5,000, and people would say, oh my gosh, for a real watercolor, a real watercolor, an authentic watercolor, assuming that, that you're correct in this and you've got a strong provenance, could be upwards into the tens of thousands, you know, probably under $50,000 for a watercolor. Also depends on, of course, size. You're saying the sheet size is only 13 by 10. So it's not all that big either. But again, I'd like to see it. And then we can make an assessment based on actual sales records and comparing sales records where similar pieces have sold recently. Okay. The Picasso people, very, very picky. So you want to make sure of that. But I'm glad that you checked in uh, to see whether or not it is, of course, an authentic piece. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see whether or not I think it's authentic too. But great. Great. Interesting, beautiful. Um, Picasso is always a good name. But remember, when you're getting to the late career work, you know, you want to make sure you're getting something terrific. But thanks for that question. That's a good question. Remember, um, we want to see pieces in, you know, what these top tier artists, you know, the Picassos, the Monets, the Renoir, the big top tier artists. You want to make sure that you're seeing pieces that are characteristic of a particular time period for them because they live long lives and they work a long time, you know. Picasso lived from 1881 to 1973. So, you know, that's a long time to be producing art from about, you know, 1900 to again, 1973. That's 73 years of making art. So 
which phase or which style that you're dealing with, which movement within his career is what you're looking at. The portrait of Jacqueline is very well known. There are prints and there are also other pieces of that same subject. So that's good to know. That's good to know. Thanks. Set of great grandmother's dishes, Haviland, France. There we go. Um, for Offer, Offer Rich and Arnold. So a couple things. You have what's called a distribution mark. That's what the Offer Rich and, and Arnold is. And Offer Fitch and Arnold, of course, is a distribution mark. What does that mean? Where did they sell them? It's the store that they were sold at. Haviland, France indicates that, of course, it was Haviland and Company, which is first established by, of course, Theodore Haviland. And then there's Charles Field Haviland, too. Limoges, France, great place for, of course, the finest clay. Um, and again, Limoges, anything that's Limoges is oftentimes identifiable, interesting. It's great grandma's dishes. I need to know how many dishes you have. Do you have service for 12? Is it a complete service? Does it have serving pieces too? Um, is it a five piece place setting, a six piece, piece place setting? What does that mean? You know, uh, dinner plate, salad plate, bread plate, teacup, saucer, you know, name it. You know, a lot of things in that set. And then how many do you have? Do you have some of the unusual pieces? Do you have large oval serving dishes, covered casseroles with the lids? Do you have a soup tureen? Do you have a creamer and a sugar? That kind of thing. So the more you have, that adds to the list. And make sure the marks are the same. What does that mean? Do they all say Haviland France, Haviland & Co, Limoges, and a distributor's mark? If they don't, that pattern may be the same. They're all the little tiny pink roses, for example. The pattern might be the same, but in fact, um, it might have been added to at different times of her life, right? Or maybe it was added to after her death, after your great grandmother's death. And that will tell you whether or not you have a pattern that was made long ago, but you added to that same pattern more contemporaneously. So that's gonna be important too. That will impact value. Try to keep sets together. Um, don't stack them in your curio cabinet or your china closet. Those, those dinner dishes should not be stacked any more than six high. Don't stack them high because that puts undue weight on the ones in the bottom and they might crack. Good, good. But they can be significantly valuable uh, depending on the pattern, if they have some gilding, if it's hand painted. You know, you could be talking upwards of more than $500 for a service for 12. So yeah, nice. China, I'm telling you, it's a sleeper. People are looking for China. They like it. You're curious. Do I have a photographic minor or just very studied? Hi, Susan. Um, people have said I have an eidetic memory. You know, um, I don't, I, I mean, I do see things. I do see, I do see the objects in my mind's eye. I've always been very good at that. Um, I, te I read it all. I read all the time. I study this all the time. There's not a day goes by when I'm not reading, studying, learning something new, doing it all the time. I do love my field and I do it all the time. Um, so when people say, how do you do this? Well, I do this all the time. And I make the joke, you know, I'm not married. I don't have kids. I don't do anything else is all I do. And that is true, but it's also loving the study of it, but also having, um, it's not so much of a memory. People think, oh, you have a good memory. It's being able to have that that sort of that image pop up in my head because I've seen so much. It does help that I've laid the foundation. You know, I know what boxes to put the objects in. So that helps too. A lot of you are doing very, very well in your own studies of all of this. Um, you know, you find out that thing that you love, that category that you love, and you're learning as much as you can about it, which is what I love about our community because people will say, well, you know, I love this, Dr. Lori, do you love this? And, you know, so that's a lot of it. But I don't know if I could say it's a photographic mind. I don't know if I'd be so egotistical, go, I have a photographic memory, I have an eidetic memory. I don't know. I love it. I learn it. I, I read it all. I read all the time. You know, it's a lot of fun. I love the objects. I love it if it's shiny. If it's shiny, I like it. <laughs> If it's pretty, I want to see it. So yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, thank you very much for those of you who always support the channel and have been supporting it for years and years. Thank you very much for that and for watching and for sharing and for telling your friends about it. I've heard a lot of people saying, oh, I'm new to the channel. I didn't know you were out there. I've been out here since 1998 doing this. So I've been out here a long time and I want you guys to, I want you guys to succeed. I want you to learn it and love it. And, you know, if you collect for yourself or if you collect because you're a reseller or if you collect just because, you know, you want to spend time with your kids or your grandkids and go out shopping, you know, whatever. 
Grandma Moses, older prince. Okay, so Grandma Moses, very well known, best known for folk art style or primitive art style pieces. Um, and she was a person who, I, she had an interesting story if you read about Grandma Moses' life. Um, so interesting. So she and Alice Neal, pretty interesting. Very, very typical, um, traditional female roles, you know, bringing up kids, taking care of homes, this kind of thing. And uh, then painting in spare time or painting well before the whole family gets up in the morning, this kind of thing. So there are a lot of prints out there by Grandma Moses. A lot of people like them. Um, the older ones, so as long as they are color lithograph prints in good condition, and they are, they are in fact not colotypes, which are posters, some of them can have some value. But what you're really looking for, and that's why I give you the loop, what you're really looking for is, you know, how do I identify whether or not I've got the real thing or a print, right? Do you have a reproduction print or are you looking at a real Grandma Moses painting? So that's the other thing. You want to make sure you distinguish that. Some of the prints can have some value. Um, more of it has to do with decorative value. What's decorative value? Well, you know, it's not probably going to let you win the, you know, win the lottery off of that painting if you resold it. The paintings are worth more, but a print, not going to be all that valuable. Probably in the $150 range for one that is from her early career work, but color lithography and a good pull, nice sharp lines, nice good color. That's what we're looking for. So I hope that helps. Um, thank you very much for your super chats and super stickers. And people go, why is she thanking all these people? Because I think it's polite to thank people. That's it. They're helping. They're helping all of you, right? Because every time that somebody does a super chat and super sticker, everybody gets help because I can do more. So I appreciate it. So thank you to all of you who are doing that. I have filigree flower brooch. All right. So filigree is that open work. Usually it's silver, uh, scroll work, open work brooch. Four layers with blue enamel center. A handmade C class. But say a C class kind of looks, if I can move my hand like this, it looks like that. And then the, the pin goes up in here and it hooks under C class, usually from the early years of the 20th century, around 1920. Uh, looks like it's hand sharpened. You're confused that it looks gold, but it has dark edges. Okay. Gold, the gold pin could have a dark edge, you know, the way in which, in fact, over time, you can see that it has aged. So you can see that sometimes if it's gold plated, a dark color can come to the gold plating area, particularly at a point where something's being touched all the time. So it, every time that pin is hitting up against that C to, to link that pin, you know, it could be that it could darken as well. Uh, the age of it based on the C claps, your piece is probably from 1905 to 1920 or so. And that's without seeing it. Filigree work is usually very popular in the early 20th century, and then it's revived after World War II. So 1900 to 1920 or revived after 1945. That's typically what we see, typically what we see. Um, I need to see the blue enamel center. I need to see the filigree clasp. I need to see the brooch itself. If I had to give a, a value to it, I need a dimension too. Is it an inch? Is it half an inch? How big is it? So good question. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Deanna. So. Um, yeah, some great, some great ideas. Jonathan, thank you very much for your, um, for your super chat, super sticker. I appreciate that too. A lot of you are, are familiar names from classes and video calls. Um, if you didn't have a chance to do a video call, I hope you'll think about it if you need it. Uh, classes are always available and a lot of people, you've been telling me what you want me to teach you. So I've got a lot of good class ideas happening based on what you like. You like my red watch? Hi, Ace. How are you? This is Swatch. I love Swatch. I have a lot of Swatch watches, all different colors. I've collected them since I was a kid in the 80s. I always liked them. Now I like them because I'm old and I can't see and they're big and I can look and it's quick and I'm like, okay, I can see what time it is. <laughs> so um, I do like them, but I have a lot of different swatches. You will see them. Um, I always get the ones, if I can, that have a date. Um, and recently uh, I bought a new one that has, um, I'll have to wear it for you. It has the the queen, Queen Elizabeth II. And actually, as the time goes around, her little outfit changes. <laughs> it's a swatch. It's really cool. I like it a lot. I'll wear it one of these times. But thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. I like red too. So thank you very much, Jennifer. I recognize Jennifer. Jennifer is, uh, you know, new to all of this. And uh, we've done a couple video calls together. And uh, actually, Jennifer, if I've got this right, correct me if I'm wrong, her birthday present, she wanted the Presidium Gemstone Tester. <laughs> 
And she asked her husband, and he said, just get it now. Don't wait for your birthday. And I was like, that's a guy. I like him. Um, but anyway, so she's doing very well in um, collecting all different types of things. So whether it's jewelry jars or you like art or maybe you like toys, toys are always a good one too. A lot of people like toys. Market isn't what it used to be when people were paying hundreds of dollars for one of those toys, but people are still looking at toys. Somebody said, I heard this online. Somebody said, nobody cares about trains. Nobody cares about trains anymore. You know, um, like Lionel trains or American flyer trains. And I'm thinking, what planet are you on? There are a lot of people collecting trains. I actually uh, had the good fortune to uh, see and evaluate a wonderful collection, one of the biggest collections in North America of, of course, toy trains. They're very popular and have been for decades. So, you know, be careful what you hear because a lot of the time it's really not, it's sometimes it's not the correct information. But yeah, so toys are oftentimes good too, going back to that last question that you had. So, um, I have a vase with a mark that says Imperial Nippon. Is this the same as Nippon? Okay, that's a good question. A couple things about Nippon indicates that it's made in Japan. Indicates that, in fact, Imperial Nippon was a term that was oftentimes utilized um, in an effort to sort of give a hierarchy to the pieces that are and how they're being decorated. So usually you'll see more intricate decoration. You'll see hand painting. You'll see moriage on Imperial Nippon pieces. But Nippon indicates it's made in Japan. It usually indicates that it's a late 19th century or early 20th century piece. So the late 1800s to about the early 1900s. And depending on size, because, you know, the size of the piece will impact the value. You want to think about that, too. So thank you very much, John. I appreciate that. Um, you made it today. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're busy in Alaska. That's okay. Everybody's busy. I'm just glad you're here. And um, I'm seeing that a lot of you are saying, hey, you know, I, I like to have the opportunity to ask some questions and to hear what other people have to say. So yeah, identifying pieces and looking at these pieces. I'm glad that you're taking some time out of your schedule to be here. I hope you'll subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed to the channel. But most of all, I want you to watch because there's a lot of information. Where do you watch? How do you get all of it? Because some of you are saying, I don't see it on YouTube. I'm not getting it. You know, I have a lot of videos that I do with a lot more information that don't only appear here. So I want you to use the binge link. The binge link is at drlorev.com. It's easy to find. You go to the specials and shop page at drlorev.com. Scroll down. There's going to be a big red button like my watch. It's going to be a big red button and it's going to say binge link. See the red button there? Um, so, and then copy that little link and put it into your browser, whether you use Google or Chrome or whatever you use, put it into your browser, maybe use Safari and basically utilize that bookmark it. So you can go back to it. It, it gives you all of my videos in order the most recent one first. So that's basically one of the best ways for you to get all the videos and not miss anything. People are saying, oh, I've seen all your videos. There's no way you've seen all my videos. So use the binge link. But any way you watch is the way I want you to watch. Watch comfortably, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. So, and don't forget to watch with your friends and family too. I've been meeting a lot of, of course, friends and family um, as I've been doing video calls recently. Uh, so that's great. Need to identify a necklace made of mother of pearl. Okay. No maker's mark, no marking at all in the center and surrounded by small flowers like mother of pearl or mother of pearl beads. It's beautiful filigree. Okay, a lot of things happening here. You're saying mother of pearl, mother of pearl, mother of pearl, all right? You're saying it's got a small flower. Is that flower carved? Is that flower um, sort of many different sort of set pearls that look like a flower form? Filigree says to me that it's scroll work and it's open work so you can sort of see through it, right? So that's not typical of mother of pearl. So I got, I would need to see it. Not having a maker's mark, don't worry about that. That's not the worst thing. We can figure it out date. We can figure it out without having, of course, a maker's mark. But a picture, a clear picture of the front, a clear picture of the back will help. Um, if you're sure it's mother of pearl and not something else, mother of pearl should have a pearlescence. What does that mean? Kind of a luster, kind of either a pinky or a brown beige or a white kind of color, um, almost like the way in which a pearl looks or the way in which the surface of a pearl looks. So you want to make sure that you see that um, if you are looking at this piece. But if it's a necklace and it just has a pendant that's mother of pearl, that's one thing. But it could be, you know, it could be, of course, something a little different. When you say a small flower that's like mother of pearl, I need to see it so we can be sure. But a lot of pieces are carved and they look like mother of pearl. So uh, you're looking for that nice luster, the luster that you see on real pearls, on actual pearls. So, 
Why did you recommend milk glass vases? They seem to be everywhere. Oh, I'll tell you because milk glass vases, those white, those white milk glass vases are very, very popular and they are, they are very, they are very versatile. So a lot of people do collect them. So in one of my videos, I was talking about milk glass vases and I recommend them on my thrift store shopping list videos, which is where I give you basically the treasure Mac, the shopping list, what you should buy, because other people oftentimes are in fact buying them. So you're saying they're everywhere. If they're everywhere to you, there are other people who are looking for them who don't have them everywhere. So you can do very well with them, particularly at the times when we're seeing weddings, uh, June, October, a lot of brides getting married in October. And of course, white for milk glass is very popular. They put them on a table. Sometimes for outdoor weddings, they're very popular. They sell very well. They resell very well. There are people who have made whole businesses just out of milk glass. So um, don't poo poo it. It might be everywhere to you. If it is, you better scoop them up because people are looking for them. <laughs> so thanks. Up oh, there's Janine. She collects milk glass. Yeah, prove my point. Thank you, Janine. Yeah, a lot of people do. So, and and I'm guessing that Janine's saying, hey, they're not everywhere where I am. Look at her on that horse. That's beautiful. That's a gorgeous animal. Gorgeous. So, no, it's a, a good question, though. I want all your questions. So, thank you for typing them in. Just put them right there in the comments. I'll get through as many as I can. I have a hand blown cobalt blue glass miniature vase. I love cobalt glass. I think it's great. Picture hand painted with golden roses. Okay, unmarked. Curious what the background on these could be in the potential resale value. Okay, a couple things. I need size, right? So, is it eight inches? Is it six inches? Is it three inches? Hand blown cobalt blue glass miniature. So I'm going to say it's probably between three and six because you said miniature. So I'm going to go with that. And then what else did you say about it? I'm sorry. Thank you to the producers for going back and forth. Picture hand painted with gold and roses. Okay, a couple things. When you see the gold on these pieces and then you see the little what are called moriage roses, you can almost touch it like it's like it's two to three dimensional. The roses are sort of ceramic enameled. That's usually one of two things. Czech glass trying to look like Florentine glass or Florentine glass from Florence, Italy. That's typical. Do the Americans make this too? Sure. Um, but if you had a piece of Florentine glass with the gold and the blue body of the glass hand blown, not Venetian glass. Don't confuse it with Murano. This is Florentine glass from Florence. Um, value on a small piece like that could be low, probably $20, high, probably $85 but it depends. And again, that's retail value based on sales records where similar pieces are sold, assuming that it's no more than I'd say five inches tall. So got to be in good condition. I want you to close your eyes and run your hand across the top of that vase. Make sure there's no pits, there's no chips, there's no abrasions. So good question. Smart. Good question. You guys have great questions tonight. You sold a 13 inch toe milk glass L.E. Smith vase for $125 last week. There you go. There it is. Proof in the pudding right there. Eastward collectibles. There it is. So yeah, I'm telling you, milk glass, always collectible. Those classic pieces are always collectible, right? You got a piece of Wedgwood. You got some milk glass. Maybe you have what's a cobalt glass, always collectible, those types of things. So Lizette's building a Native American pottery collection. So we'll get back to that one. How do you know how to match a vintage lamp to a correct shade if it was bought without a shade. Okay. I actually write a, wrote a column about this in my syndicated newspaper column years ago. And basically there are different shapes that go with different bodies or different bases, right? So you want to make sure that you have the right shape for the actual base. So this is why when people are kind of saying, uh, you've seen these, it's kind of a, um, a brass base, a, figurine, like a Capa de Monte figurine of a lady with a dress kind of thing. And then she's got a pole going up her back, right? And then they put a shade on it and the shade has fringes and it's kind of getting in her eyes. You know, you know that that's not the original. So you want to think about contrast, but you want to think about something that also complements. So if it looks like it's too big, then it probably isn't the right shade. A lot of people prefer to purchase the lamps without a shade and then to add a shade later even. But if you can get the original shade, like the mid-century modern shades, for example, if you have the opportunity to buy it with the shade, buy it with the shade, even if the shade's not in great shape, because again, the purist collectors, if you're a reseller, want to see the original shade. So how do you know how to match it? You want to make sure that it's not overwhelming too big for it. You want to make sure that it actually will cover the light bulb if it's an electric lamp, it's an electric light, light, not a lamp. 
if it's an electric light, right? So you want to make sure that it covers the bulb. You want to make sure that you choose the split the shade with the light on. So people go, how do you do that? So, you know, you're in wherever you have to plug it in, get the light on and then start trying on different shades. If the original shade is with it, go with the original shade. So thank you very much. Hope that helps. Sorry, itchy. Uh, taking your class to the camp. Oh yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, the classes are very popular. I love them too. It's two hours of a lot of fun and a lot of information. Actually, I usually go long anyway. And, and you can stick around and just, most people stick around if you don't want to, you can, but you see everybody's object. It's a lot of fun and you learn a lot and we have kept the price very, very low purposefully. So I'm happy that you're able to, to do it. Um, if you didn't sign up yet, I suggest you go to drlaurev.com. It'll say appearances. That's of course our events page. That's how you of course sign up at drlaurev.com and you can pay right online with a credit card. So we made it very easy for you. Um, how do you go? How do you get, how do you submit your photos? Same place, drlaurev.com. Easy to do, easy to do. So um, blue Royal Copenhagen dinner plates depends on the pattern, depends on whether or not you have Blue Royal Copenhagen. If you haven't seen them, they have that nice wave, of course, of the sea. Um, and if you've been to Copenhagen, I've been to Copenhagen several times and, um, the blue of the sea, it really is very, very blue, but those, they have those characteristic waves. And I've been in the Royal Copenhagen factory where they actually hand paint these pieces, Gorgeous, gorgeous pieces. They look similar to Blue Onion, but it's not. That's because a lot of the Royal Copenhagen pieces actually mimic, of course, um, Blue Onion, which is a mycin pattern. It has a little Blue Onion in it and then other flowers. You have a dozen of those. Those are going to be pretty valuable. Are they 8 inches? Are they 9 inches? Are they 10 inches? It will depend on their, their diameter. So take out that measuring tape and, and measure the diameter. If the mark on the back has the three waves and then the Royal Copenhagen symbol, uh, you're probably looking at, of course, 20th century Royal Copenhagen pieces, hand glazed, hand painted, and can be rather valuable. So one plate could be as much as 50 to $75 for one plate. You're saying you have a dozen, 12 is good, 12 is good. No cracks, no chips, I'm assuming at those values. And again, based on actual sales records where similar pieces have sold. So when somebody says, how does she know this? It was back to Susan's question of, do you have an eidetic memory? I do this all the time. And I'm always looking at analyzing the market. And that's not just looking up sales records. That's analyzing the market and what's popular now. So, of course, those beautiful Danish dishes, just like if you're in Copenhagen, you, there's Royal Copenhagen here. You go down through the square, you go over here and you're at George Jensen. You know, all of those great designers of, of course, um, Denmark are right there on that same drag. So. Yay to Wilshire. Well, yay to Wilshire. <laughs> it's nice to see all of you. Of course, many folks who have been following me for years, for decades, enjoying, of course, um, all the information and loving art, antiques, and collectibles, too. I love all of you. Yes, they have the waves. That's right. They have the waves. So is pewter worthwhile to collect and resell? Um, yeah. You know what, Shirley? I have to say that um, there's a couple of different things about pewter. People are seeing pewter again. You know, this all works in cycles, and I've talked about this a lot. I talk about the 50 and 100 year cycle. Pewter was very popular in the 1970s, and you're seeing the 50 year mark, and you're seeing, of course, pewter coming back again. People like that because pewter, of course, doesn't have the same kind of what I always call, uh, you know, uh, condition and cleaning responsibilities. You don't have to keep cleaning it all the time the way you have to polish silver plate and polish sterling silver. People like pewter, they like, of course, the weightiness of it. Um, they like these pieces, but yeah, Wilton is pretty straightforward. They're not all that expensive either to source, you know, to buy and then also to resell. But yeah, people are seeing it now. I don't think it's going to have a long life with collectors. I think you got to kind of, and same thing with brass. You got to get in, you got to get some, you got to resell it quickly and move on because I think What's, it, what's this? I think probably within the next three to five years, you're going to see all the pewter like, okay, we don't care about pewter. We don't care about brass. The metals have their, their peak and then they go. But this is the 50 year cycle. It was popular in the 70s and it's back again. Good question. Smart. So, and thank you all for, of course, your super chats and your super stickers. I think they're great. Um, I want you to think about these. Your Wedgwood sells and most people don't buy it for resale. So I get it inexpensively. There's still collectors out there. 
Yeah, um, a couple of things. You're saying they don't buy it for resale, so you get it inexpensively, but then you say there are collectors out there. So, you know, a couple of things. It's good you're getting it inexpensively. Um, I see a lot of people who spend a lot on Wedgwood. I see a lot of collectors who are very dedicated to Wedgwood. Um, and I'm seeing that it's not so much, it's a lot of younger people who are saying, grandma had this, so I want it. People like the stories, the classical myths that go along with the Jasperware figures on Wedgwood. Um, things like Ulysses, you know, and the Chariot of Victory, those kinds of things. You know, these stories that are wonderful stories or Venus and Mars or the different mythological stories that are featured on a piece of Wedgwood. So people like that very much. And people like some of the unusual and uncharacteristic pieces like match safes or um, uh, cache pots or biscuit jars that are Wedgwood. So I can see Wedgwood does have a very, very strong collecting community. Um, don't poo poo the Wedgwood and I know you're not. So that's a nice one, that's a nice one. What do I like to collect? What items do I like to research? I'll research anything, I think everything's fascinating. That's just how it is. I think it's all fascinating. I see all of this as the stuff that people made over time in history. And I think it doesn't matter who made it, what it was. I think it's just wonderful to learn more about those people and how they lived. I think that's cool. Um, what do I like to collect? I've been a collector since I was a little tiny kid. Um, my, my dad was really uh, someone who loved to collect things. <laughs> Sometimes to my mother's chagrin, so much stuff. Um, but again, uh, there are certain things that I always that I always have loved. Um, some of them have to do with personal family pieces that I've always loved. Um, but in terms of it, I've studied American art for a long time, and I enjoy that. Um, I also enjoy things that are just uh, glass animals. I always collected those as a small child, and I loved them, hand-blown glass animals. When I first was in... Um, Venice, uh, the first time to Venice, I was like, we got to go to Murano, you know, and that was a long time ago, a long time ago. Um, I'm very happy someone was nice about saying about the hard work and the good work. I'm happy to work hard. Um, I'm happy to work hard. And I'm very happy when I hear that you folks are succeeding because of my hard work. And it's not only me, you know, we have producers and staff and folks who are helping. So anytime you do, you know, a, a super chat or a super sticker, you're helping and you're helping to continue it, but I'm happy to do it. I do love my field. And, you know, I'm in the field. I'm not just, oh, you know, I did this and I kind of came to it. This is what I always thought was wonderful and interesting. Did not come from particular wealth and thought beautiful items in museums were amazing. And I loved to learn about, you know, the history of the ancient Greeks or the history of the ancient Romans or, you know, what was happening in France in the 19th century, you know, after the Franco-Prussian War or World War II collectibles or, you know, what, what they're making from last week or, you know, anthropomorphic digital art. I don't care what it is. I think it would be interesting and fascinating because it's what people think are think is interesting. So yeah, I collect a lot of stuff. I've collected birdhouses for a long time. When I go to a particular place, I like to pick up an unusual birdhouse. People have been nice enough to make me birdhouses. So that's fun. I'm glad you're new here. I'm glad you're learning. Um, I'm happy to talk about my personal interests. You know, people always say, talk more about you, but I always think I'm boring. Why do you want to hear about me? And people go, you're not boring. But um, my personal interest, I do like to cook when I'm lousy at it. I start fires and I'm not kidding. Like you know, fires in the kitchen because <laughs> I get I get involved in something else. I walk away. I read a novel. I'm like, oh, I was cooking something, you know, you know, so that's not good. Um, I'm not good at that. That's why I show you a lot of my successes when I cook something and it's not burnt. I'm so proud. So that's why you're seeing that. Um, other things that I think about, I do like design. I've always liked design. Um, I'm pretty good at color. Uh, sometimes when there's a handyman in my house and, you know, something's off by a little bit, it might even be like an eighth of an inch, I can tell. So they're kind of like, oh, gosh, you know, so I'm kind of hard on the guys who are are doing like, you know, fixing a doorknob or something. It's not really perfect. You know, I'm kind of anal that way. I have, it has to be the visual is hard. You know, I have to have it perfect. I'm like that. Um, I like my swatch watches, you know, Ace point, points that out. So you break stuff in the kitchen. You know, when I'm tired, I drop things and I break things. But I try very hard. I have some some things that I really, really love, so I don't touch them a lot. I have my Aunt Dorothy's old, um, I'll, I'll have to show that uh, at some point. I'll bring it into the studio. Uh, her old uh, Blue Ridge china that, you know, we always used. We used it all the time when I was growing up. But now I'm kind of afraid of it because I think I'll break it. 
but um, I really like it. It has those little tulips, has these little kind of curves in the, um, in the uh, teacups. Um, a couple of my sisters are better at drinking tea and being careful. And I'm kind of a bull in the China shop. So I'm careful with those types of things, but I have lots of things I love. And it's similar to the things that you guys love. I love quality. I love that you folks can identify quality with my help. I like to see something that's very beautifully and handmade. I don't let things go away from me that my work, I like my work to be work that is the best it can be. I'm picky about that. I don't like the, oh my gosh, I could make a mistake. I check and I double check things. Um, when someone says, oh, it's not that, they don't sell it for that. Don't you think I didn't check it? Don't you think I didn't double check it? And don't you think I didn't check to make sure that the person, you know, whoever source I've got is correct too. So I, I'm like that because I wanna make sure that you're getting the right information. Um, but yeah, uh, I love it. You can tell I love it. Why would I do it if I didn't love it? You gotta do what you love. You gotta do what you love. That's why I wanna see you guys, you know, I wanna see you uh, buying. I want you to see you collecting what you love. I want you to see learning about it. It's a lot of fun. So we've got some great questions and I appreciate those too. What are the razor-like pointed sharp metal pieces used in picture framing? Those are called framers points. Okay. And they're different throughout the ages. So I've shown you these on videos and a lot of you have asked me to do classes on uh, how do you sell online, which I'm going to do. Uh, and and framing, you want framing tips. And I've done videos about that. And there's also a lot of information at drlaurieb.com under a tab called research. You can go there and it'll say art and antiques and click on that. And it's going to open up a whole world of information. But the razor point, like pointed sharp metal pieces used in picture framing are used, those that you described are used in the 60s, the 70s and 80s. And they change. They're little they're little diamond shaped in the 60s. By the time they get to the 80s, they look like little metal arrows. Prior to that, they're little tiny brad nails, brad nails, little tiny ones. Um, you'll also see sometimes what they do is they have a gun. You know, I, actually, I'll, I'll show you one of these. It's called a framer's point gun. And they they put like the, basically the magazine of the... Um, the magazine of the framers points in, and then they just basically put it in all the way around the frame. So you basically, you know, go up all the way through and that would make sure that the backboard doesn't come off the actual frame. So that's what they're called. They're called framers points and they look like a point and they secure the backboard to the frame. They're very important and they can help you identify time period if you start to learn what they look like and I know I've shown you these in videos, but I'll do something more comprehensive too. So good question. Framing can tell you a lot about quality of a piece. Framing can tell you a lot about also um, the age of a work of art. So look at the frames, look at the back, and I've taught you what to look. I know you're seeing all these other people are telling you what to look for in the back, thanks to me. Uh, you know, that happens. But basically I want you to understand what the color of the canvas should be, what the color of the stretcher should be, do they have staples? Do they have nails? What should it look like? And what should those framers points look like? It will give you a lot of information. I'm helping you to understand, you know, I call it ASI. It's antique scene investigations, like CSI without the blood, I used to say. But basically all those factors that go into you identifying and deciphering what you're looking at. So that's what you're looking at. So that's good too. That's really good. That's great. So terrific ideas too. My favorite time period to study, um, I've studied the Renaissance. I think the Renaissance and the Baroque are fabulous and interesting. I love American works of the 20th and 21st century. The 19th century, you're not going to beat because you got everything from Queen Victoria to the Impressionists. You know, you've got, you've got things like Picasso, people like Picasso coming of age. Um, I like the Rococo, um, Catherine the Great, and of course, the time of uh, Louis the 15th and all of those lovely ladies in their dresses. I like the Rococo. So I don't know if I have a favorite time period. That would be hard for me. I like history of all time periods. I think the ancient Greeks were great with their, their parties where they would basically, um, they would basically recline and drink wine and, and discuss, of course, the ideas of the day. I thought they were fascinating too. Uh, not unlike some of the things we do today, go all the way back to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. So that's kind of cool too. So I don't know if I could pick a favorite. I'm sorry, Janine. I, I have a lot of historical time periods that I think are cool. So, you know, when you're true to it, you're true to it. So that's kind of fun. That's kind of fun. Um, my favorite museum in the U.S. Hmm. 
My favorite museum in the U.S. My favorite painting in the U.S. is Cecilia Bowes, Ernesta and her nurse, Ernesta Drinker and her nurse at the Metropolitan Museum. That's my favorite painting. That's the painting that really made me want to study art history, the American Impressionists, a female artist. My favorite museum is probably still the Yale University Art Gallery in New Haven, my hometown. I do love that museum. Um, I love the Louis Kahn building. I love the fact that the British Art Museum is right across the street. Um, I love, of course, the Catherine Ordway collection. Um, uh, the Night Cafe is there from, of course, Van Gogh, but in the in the U.S., uh, some fabulous paintings. There's a wonderful Jackson Pollock there. Um, the the um, the Dura Europa's collection is beautiful. Uh, I had a wonderful time working at Yale uh, in my early career. It was fantastic. I love that museum very much. I have other favorite museums too. I love the Uffizi in Florence. Um, I enjoy the Louvre. There are some museums that you just can't miss, these small little tucked away museums that are wonderful. Uh, in Istanbul, uh, that was a, the Topaki Palace was a fantastic museum. Um, there are a lot of great museums. Anytime you have a chance, um, the Royal Collections, right? Um, the Palace in Scotland is fantastic. Uh, my goodness, there's a lot. But the, well, I'll say Yale. Um, and my alma mater, the University of Michigan, has a beautiful museum as well. So if you're near Ann Arbor, you know, stop in there too. And um, I worked at, the Penn, at Penn State's the Palmer Museum uh, when I was in graduate school. That's a very nice museum. So great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a nice question too. Thanks. You're asking all stuff about me. That's so funny. Um, but lots of things to do. So before we go, <laughs> I want to get in what's really important, which is my deals. I know you're watching my deals. Um, the Night Cafe, there are a couple of Van Gogh Night Cafes, so I want you to be clear. The Night Cafe is at Yale. There's another version in, the, of course, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, which is beautiful. Oh, and the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam is something to see. Um, so they are, they are different forms of it, <coughs> excuse me, different versions of it. Um, but yes, Yale has a night cafe. Um, the blood red walls of the night cafe. Um, but the deals, because I'm doing deals videos so you guys can find the deals. I'm searching for you so you can get those deals because I want to help you with the treasure map and I'm all about treasure hunting and you know that. So um, here are the ones that I want you to know about that I found for you. Um, first of all, I want to remind you, I don't know these sellers. I did not appraise any of these objects, but I want you to be aware of some deals that I found online. So um, first is on eBay, and I'm going to give you an item number here or how to search for it once you get to that particular place. So on eBay, the item number is here, and it's an Alice Cavanis gold-plated costume jewelry enamel bangle bracelet. Now, Type in the item number at eBay, of course, right there. It's a late 19th, it's a late 20th century piece, a so late 1900s piece, right? And um, at the time of this video, the bidding started at $1.25. That's right, $1.25 for the bidding on this particular very nice, beautiful enamel. It's um, gold plated. It's enamel with a green and also a yellow golden color. Scroll work detail. Nice big, nice big bangle bracelet. Marked Alice Can Alice Cavanis, very well known, of course, costume jewelry designer. One dollar and twenty five cents is the bidding right now. At the time of this video, what's it worth? Two hundred and seventy five dollars. So that's one that you gotta watch. You gotta find. So. Yeah, I love the Cleveland Museum, and in Youngstown, the Butler is a great place, too. Um, don't forget about the Chicago Art Institute. But I could be going crazy, you know, talking about all of these museums a million times. So thanks for your help, Deb, but there's so many museums I love. That's kind of not a fair question. And then the second deal that I want you to know about is on a uh, website that you may not be familiar with. It's called C.T. Bids, like Cat Thomas Bids, B-I-D-S. C.T. Bids has a very, very beautiful watercolor up for bid right now. And it is by the California artist Vernon Nye. And Vernon Nye was an early 20th century artist. He lived from 1915 to 2013. He's a member of the American Watercolor Society. How do you find it on the C.T. 
Bids website. Again, I don't know these sellers. I didn't appraise these objects. You just go to CT Bids and put in the, the his name, Vernon Nye, and this beautiful watercolor of a park landscape with figures will be there. It's 21 by 27 inches framed. It's in a nice frame and it is a watercolor. Remember, it says AWS after his signature right on that watercolor, which means he's a member of the prestigious American Watercolor Society. At the time of this video, bidding for that started at a buck. A buck, that's right. What's it worth? It's worth $500. I'm showing you the deals. I'm telling you how to tell. I know, don't listen to me if you don't want to listen to me about precious moments, but I'm telling you how to actually give, I'm giving you the keys to the castle, the treasure map, so you can find the stuff. I'm Dr. Lori. It's good to be with all of you. Thanks for your great questions and for being with me. Love your community. See you soon.